without question, the people that succeed are never the most talented. It's always the people that consistently move forward, put things out, adjust, try different tactics. Those are the people that succeed always, always, always. It's never the quiet, lone genius that succeeds in my experience. What's going on? You're listening to episode 55 of the Perspective Podcast, and I'm your host, Scotty Russell of Perspective Collective. The show is about carving out time to build something for yourself and about being open to seeing things from a different perspective. I feel there's never one way of doing things, and I want to share what is and isn't working for me, along with sharing my guest point of view. A couple quick announcements. I'm going to have a new wave of products added to my store here within the next week over at perspective-collective.com. The popular pizza party sticker packs are going to be back and there's only going to be a limit of 50 along with 50 additional sticker packs with some new unreleased designs. Also, this one I'm pretty stoked about. I'm going to have a limited run of screen printed pizza boxes with three unreleased 10 by 10 prints in collaboration with Brian McClaskey of Industry Print Shop. Seriously, these turned out so dope. I shared a lot of it on my Instagram stories, but there's a limited run of those. So once those are gone, they're gone. They're not going to be printed anymore. And then finally in my shop, you're going to find the pizza pens at a discount and the whole shop will be updated with a ton of original drawings that need to find a happy home for the holidays. And here's the catch. The people on my newsletter team over at perspective-collectiveteam.com There's going to be an opening stretch of days where they're going to get first dibs with the best deals as I like to reward loyal subscribers. If you're wanting some custom art gifts before they are released to the public, then join the team. All right, let's get down to business. You're in for a treat today if you're in the mindset of creating a passive income with your creative side hustle, especially going into the new year, if that's a focus of yours. Today's guest is Dustin Lee of Retro Supply Co., who's built a thriving business of creating brushes, textures, and fonts inspired by historic vintage material to help you take your work to the next level. Not only that, but he is the brains behind Passive Income from Designers, which is exactly what you would think. It helps you get started making your own products and locking down those first sales. He's also a part of the Honest Designer podcast, which provides business insight to help you scale your creative hustle. Dude, this episode is a gold mine. In this episode, we talk about making, creating things you wish you saw in the world, decision making and finding ways to stand out, taking action when your back is against the wall, the benefits of collaborating and building relationships, and one of my favorite things is the practical steps for creating and launching your first product. By far, this is one of my favorite episodes as Dustin does not hold back with the value, and he also wants to give you a little something something for you listening today. Stick around to the end to find out how you can win a free t-shirt of his Retro Supply Co. uh, little logo mascot. I have one. I'm wearing it right now. It's dope as hell. And find out also how you can get a hefty discount on your first purchase through RetroSupply.co. You can find the show notes to this episode with links to everything that we talk about at Perspective-Collective.com slash 55. Also, if you think this episode can help someone else, please, please, please give it a quick share on social media. It's because of you that the show is growing, and I appreciate it more than you could ever possibly know. All right, how about we finally get into the show? Jeez. Today, I'm joined by one of my most favoriteest people I've met in 2017, Dustin Lee of Retro Supply Co. and Passive Income for Designers. Dustin, getting you on the show is a highlight for me, especially today, and I'm stoked to have you here, brother. Oh, thank you so much, man. I'm so excited to be on your show. And I got to tell you something. I've been thinking about you a lot in a, um, because of your pizza talk. It's been so stuck in my head. Like yesterday, we literally, so I'm out of town with my family. Yesterday, we literally bought Gino's pizza rolls because I remembered this tweet you did where you talked about like putting them <laughs> on top of pizzas. And so when we were there, I bought this gigantic bag and I was like, that's because of Scott. And yeah, it's really funny. Like pizza triggers me now. Was it, think about was it good? The pizza rolls? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I've had the Gino's kind. Uh, or maybe they're Totino's. I'm Totino, sorry. I, there you go. Yes, my bad. Yeah, Totino's. Yeah, they were good. I'm not super great at keeping them from exploding. So like they kind of mm. like exploded out the sides, but they were still good. You kick them with the oven? 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Get well, the crispiness going. Yeah. 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 See, I, I got real gangster and I put a couple on my salad. <laughs> yeah. It totally reverses like the like healthiness of the salad. Yeah. Nice. But YOLO, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. For those in my audience who don't know, give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself. So I am the owner of a business called Retro Supply Co. We sell brushes, textures, fonts, and other stuff inspired by historic material and made digital. It's basically time-saving, legit stuff for basically illustrators. We get a lot of designers, but I've noticed it's been trending towards illustrators a lot more. I'm also the owner of Passive Income for Designers, which is a site dedicated to helping designers make a side income with creative skills. And in the past year, I've started a podcast called the Honest Designers Podcast with three other people, Tom Ross, Ian Bernard, and Lisa Glanz, who are talented letterers and illustrators and uh, web designers in their own right. So that's my... Wow. That was that was right to the point. That was a perfect elevator pitch, man. Yeah, I took a note of that because I wanted to try to be concise. So. That was that was perfect. Uh, something that really drew you to me, obviously, our, our mutual friend Diane Gibbs has mutually plugged us. I don't even know how many times I've kind of spaced that off, but... When I heard you talk at Weapons, I I think you even said you felt our stories paralleled a lot from, you know, being lost, kind of down in the dumps, depressed, uh, anxiety, all the mix and and the, some of the obstacles we've been through to get to where we are today. I know you and I are both familiar with Rock Bottom. So what are some of the biggest hurdles you've had to overcome to actually get to where you are today? Because I absolutely love your story and you don't have to be brief about this one. OK, yeah. So. I went to, I wasn't into art since I was a kid. I went to something called the Vancouver School of Arts, which is a magnet school and studied art and particularly music. I thought that was going to be my career. And then I got accepted to go to Berkeley College of Music to study music. And it's really expensive for people that aren't familiar with it. It's like 60, I think it was $60,000 a year when I wanted to go. And I, my parents had promised me my whole life uh, that, or not really promised me, but they basically said, you know, you get the good grades, we'll get you into the school you want to go to. And when they said, I think they saw the price tag on that and realized that it was for music, it just wasn't like possible. And so I wasn't able to go, but I also got cold feet and didn't go because it was just so much debt to take on for something that there's no guarantee of making money. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, I can figure out the art part myself and I'll work on the business part because I felt like what really pushes artists down is that they don't have business skills. So I thought, well, what better way to learn about business than get a business admin degree and work at a bank since banks are so business-like, I'll go work at a bank. So I went and worked at a bank and I was miserable and I got a business degree. And I remember right before I got married, I told my wife to my fiance at the time, let's get married, but I have to quit doing this. I have to do design. I just, I want to do design. I want to do art. I can't be a banker my whole life. And so I went to community college for it and just started freelancing and it was just a struggle. We were, she was supporting us completely. I wasn't making almost any money at all. In fact, I still have this felt board with marker where I put my goal for the month of how much to make. It was like $1,200. I was just, if I could make $1,200. That would have been amazing. And I remember I was struggling to make that. And on top of that, I was drinking a lot. I had panic attacks. Mm hmm it was just bad. And, um, we moved down to California and I tried to start a startup that was failing and making $0. So at that point I was making nothing. And then we found out my wife was pregnant with our first daughter and something in me just like snapped. Like, I guess once I realized I'd be taking care of someone else, we were down there, we were living with my grandma, taking care of her. And I was like, I don't want to be this guy that drinks too much and smell his breath smells like alcohol to his kids. And, he's not making any money and not showing that you can do things that you want to do. And I just snapped out of it in a, in a way. And I started waking up really early every morning and pure desperation. I just started making products because my days were filled with this startup that was making no money and I couldn't stop doing that. So two or three hours every morning I was making products and what were these products like? Why, what, what sparked you to make this? Was it something that you personally needed that could help your workflow or something that you saw a need for? Yeah, well, I had been working for a business called pay to exist and it had a retro theme to it. And I always enjoyed nostalgic design. 
So uh, I had also been really into creative market. This is when creative market first came out. For anyone who doesn't know what creative market is, it's essentially a marketplace to buy digital design products. And I had been going to this site and looking for things to buy, and it was so hard to find good stuff, which I found so weird because as designers, our jobs are, a part of our jobs is to make things attractive and make you want to buy them because they look so great. And it was so funny because all these great designers were on there, like legit great designers, but when it came to making their products attractive and designing how the product looked to people, they kind of haphazardly did it. And I don't know if it was because they didn't have faith that it would do well or why, but I decided I'm going to make the things in this shop that I wish were in the shop that I can't find. And so I just started doing that. And my only goal was real simple. Once a week, something comes out. Come hell or high water, once a week, something gets released. And I did that for about four or five weeks. And then there was a day that I was in, it was, it was, I was at Starbucks. I was working on products like I always do every morning. And my phone started doing the little beeps for emails. And I look at the emails and I notice it's like someone purchased your product on Creative Market. Except for normally it's like you, I'd get those maybe once or twice a day. And this time it was like, the ding, the ding. The ding, 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 the ding. I mean, just none. I mean, they they were like starting to overlap and like stutter on top of each other. There was so many, and each one was like nine dollars in my pocket. And I literally packed up all my stuff at Starbucks and I ran home to our house where we were living with my grandma around the corner to go show my wife. I wanted her to hear the phone going off because we were broke, Scott. I mean, just remember we were completely broke and we had a baby on the way. I mean, we couldn't even afford diapers. And I showed it to her and it was still ringing and I was like, every one of those beeps is $9 or whatever it was in our pocket. And by the end of the day, we had made, I think, around $1,700. Man. And I'm sure a lot of people listening can relate. I mean, that was more than I had made in two weeks in my whole life. I'd never made that much money in two weeks. Mm -hmm. One day I made it. I couldn't believe it. It was so real. So obviously I started investing more time in that. And within three months, uh, it was making around, gosh, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 a month. It really was amazing. And I don't take credit for that. Um, I think it's a mix of God helping me and helping me to stop drinking and focusing more. I think there's a large degree of luck that came into the picture. And I think that just because I was doing what I loved and not trying to please people or overthinking it, because I was just, you know, I was desperate. I was just doing what I wanted to do. I, it just forced my hand, it forced me to do stuff. And it, yeah, it was amazing. Man, I, I think not necessarily luck because I, I'm a big believer in, you know, creating your own opportunities and, you know, seeing a need for something and, you know, having, what would you say, the ambition or the drive to actually put some action into work. So I, I think you were the catalyst all along at the same time. So I, I feel you probably need to give yourself a little bit more credit there, Dustin, because uh, you're one of the hardest working people I know out there. <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. If I hadn't been getting up every morning, if I hadn't spent years and years trying to build businesses and reading entrepreneurship books and listening to podcasts and working for, I worked for a, a brilliant online marketer for a couple of years. If I hadn't done all those things because mm -hmm. I love them and because I really want to make this happen, it wouldn't have happened. I think by luck, I just mean, I understand that like things come into place and I want, I don't want people to feel like, I think a lot of people can be easy to feel like if I'm not succeeding, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a toxic way to think. Sure, like you need to take responsibility and try and work hard and hustle, but you got to realize that there's outside things that control success, right? So like when I got on creative market, it was empty. I chose, it was an arbitrary decision to choose to be on creative market. I just happened to choose to sell there. It was a new platform. They were looking for stars, um, for lack of a better word. They were looking for people yeah. to feature. And I happened to be making some products that stood out. Me choosing creative market was not a strategic thing. It was, I just chose it and it happened to be a lucky thing where I got a land grab early. Would I have eventually got something else? I'm sure I, I probably would have, but what I, I just want to make sure people don't punish themselves if they don't succeed when they're working hard. And yeah. I, cause I think there is a degree of luck to it. And I think there's a big thing with it. I've learned through all the shitty jobs I've had and getting dumped on and treated like crap at specific places, or I wondering why the hell I'm here. 
looking back at all those little opportunities, there was one little nugget that, you know, I didn't realize at the time, but I've brought along with me to the next job. And then I've learned one thing at that crappy job and it's helped me at this next job. So like wherever you are right now, there's some kind of takeaway or something that you're being groomed for the next step in life. And, you know, I feel you can totally relate to that. Oh, absolutely. I look back, there's certain things that I, I learned. One of the biggest moments for me was when I started working for this company called Pay to Exist that was um, helping solopreneurs build their first businesses. Mm-hmm. And I remember as I started to understand how the entire sales process worked for a very small, simple business with for one man. And when I saw that, it was just this valuable information to understand and see that it worked. It's one thing to have someone tell you, here's what you need to do. And you kind of think, is that BS? Is that true? Or is that just someone trying to make a blog post and fill up space? And to see all these things working and see what was really working was was gold. So yeah, you're, you're totally right. You pick up these things from real experience. And the more you can pick up, the more likely your chance of succeeding. Well, and something else I'm very envious and I admire of you is that you don't cut corners, especially I think that's probably how you stood out in creative market anyway. Like anybody can put something out quickly, but you put that little extra effort in the little details to make those product shots, you know, the things that you'll see make people see like, Hey, I can actually do this with my work. And now I've seen all these other products kind of copy your formula on things. And you seem to always go that little extra step in for me as artists and designers going that little extra mile and putting your own finesse and touch on things could be that difference of you standing out on the explore page on Instagram or wherever it is, you know, creating your own opportunities by going the extra mile. So I want to commend you for that too, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I, I think that um, early on something that I decided was a digital product should be as attractive as a physical product. So you know when you walk into a store and you see something that's just so awesome looking, you have to pick it up, you have to pick the box box up and look at it? I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. You know, it just looks so cool, something about it, and you're drawn to it. I find this with puzzles and weird, I don't know what the word is, just like I love those weird stores where you'll find all sorts of weird toys and things. Like thrift shops or? Like, um... Because I like those. (laughs) Like for instance, people aren't going to be able to see this, but like right here, I just bought this the other day at a, at a like kind of a small bookshop. It's just this little puzzle. It's like a little physical puzzle. People can't see it, but it's like just a little puzzle of made of wood. But it's in this kind of cool box. It's an orange box, and it has cool coffee on it. And I was always drawn to that. And I always thought, when you make a product, people should feel like they're walking in somewhere and seeing all sorts of cool packages of things that they want to pick up and look at. Cause that's what I wanted, so that's no, why that, I, I that, did it. That's awesome. Where did the name Retro Supply Co. come? Like the the day that you had the slot machine, you know, was right. did you already brand yourself as Retro Supply Co.? No, I had some sort of really dorky name. I don't even remember the name. It was. I literally don't. I no joke. I don't remember the name. I wasn't called Retro Supply when we had our first big sales. So where did the name come from? The name came, um, it was, I mean, a, a 20 second decision. Literally, I, I understood from working for the, in internet marketing before that, that people are scanning the internet quickly. They're not going to spend a lot of time trying to understand the deeper meaning behind what you describe yourself as. So I wanted a name that would really quickly cut to the chase and give people a very good clue as to what we are offering. And I think most people should do that in their businesses. Your name should give a pretty decent idea of what you're doing. So people don't have to do work to figure out what it was. So I, I mean, I came up with retro supply literally 20 seconds. It was just, Hey, we're selling kind of retro and inspired stuff. And supply was something that's connected and associated with historical things and trend trending things. And so I chose it because I thought it helped mm. to attract that quickly. It's it's working for you. Well, now I'm feeling like Perspective Collective is a little too abstract. <laughs> I don't I don't no, you know, I told someone the name of that earlier today and they said it was awesome, but I also think that you have such a strong personal brand ah. that it ties it all together. Like, like I mean, think about it, dude. I bought pizza rolls and thought of you. <laughs> like think about that. Like think about the the marketing money that goes into pizza. And think about how one time you being on a stage talking about pizza and your pizza game being strong, like led me to actually 
think of pizza of you anytime I eat I pizza. I never so. meant for these things to get out of control, <laughs> but now I'm like Facebook and Instagram direct the direct messages. And my mom bought me like these pizza emoji pillows the other day. I'm like, Jesus, mom, I don't need these, but thank you so much. <laughs> That, that's funny. Well, uh, something important, something I struggle with, because sometimes I'm just in create mode, create, create, create. And what's hard for me is to turn off the creation switch and focus on flipping the business switch. How mm-hmm. do you balance the time of, you know, creating and then being in business mode? Do you get to do you get to do a lot of creating these days? You seem heavy in the business side of things, helping other creators create. Yeah, I am heavy in the business side. And when people ask me what I do, I always tell them I'm, I consider myself more of a person that's an entrepreneur and, and, and design is a secondary thing. Ah. I'm a designer, but if you were, if someone was really to force my hand, I would say I, I'm into entrepreneurship and it just so happens that I'm expressing that through design. I enjoy design and I think I enjoy design because of the entrepreneurial possibilities. I mean, think as a designer, what's so cool about that is like Scott, me or you or anybody listening that does design can make a package and come up with how like a prototype for a physical product or a digital product looks in an evening over a pot of coffee. They can make something and that's a very special skill of design. In fact, I started doing design because I wanted to be able to make all the graphics for products and entrepreneurial things. So the way I look at it is that business can be one of the most creative exercises of all. It doesn't have to end at design. Perfect example when when you when you invited me onto this show. Which, thank you so much. I'm so honored to Hell be on yeah. the show. But you sent me a PDF, right? Mm-hmm. And it was the instructions, and it had this cool illustration. I think of like some pizza dude at top, and like you had this friendly welcoming message at the top, and you had all the instructions, and they were laid out beautifully to get you prepared for the show, right? Mm-hmm. Not everybody does that. And that's like a business thing, but like you injected your creativity into the business part of it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. So like I look at business kind of like that. I'm like, you made a creative business decision by doing that and you brought it to it. So I think in your business, there's so many opportunities to do that. And and I try to do that with the products that we make too. I like that. I think we need to have you on another episode in the future and maybe nerd out a little bit more about business. Oh, of the creative game because I'm, I'm really trying to focus more on the business side of things, growing the podcast, attracting more specific types of freelance and, you know, more plugging out there to maybe get the right sponsors for the show to help this show grow. So um, I'm already booking you in for some time in 2018. I'm not going to take no for an answer. It's already made. It's already determined. So, <laughs> Dude, I talk to you about business any day of the week. <laughs> yeah, I need it. I, I, I'm, I'm big in surrounding myself with the people who are where I'm trying to go and who are already there, and you're definitely one of them. Oh, wow. I already think of you as being there, but thanks. Not from the business side. I, I, help, draw, I help you draw. You help me get the business game. Okay, you could too, because I just started this drawing challenge thing for myself, and I could use your help on it. I so. got you, man. I okay. got you. We'll okay, talk cool. off air. Okay. So something I'm a huge believer in is collaboration. And I feel you've built a lot of success off Retro Supply Co. Off collaboration, working with people like Von Glitchka, Brad Woodward, uh, Amy Hoodlum. Mm -hmm. Uh, How has collaborating, Jason Karn, freaking love that dude. How has collaboration benefited your business and how can it benefit someone else's business? Or just personal projects, side side business, side projects. Right, yeah. Well, first there's the obvious benefit, which is you get to make stuff with your heroes, right? Yeah. So that's a huge benefit is you get to interact in a deeper, more meaningful way with people that share the same love of things that you do. That's obvious exciting. In fact, I've met most of my good friends through collaborations and Brad Woodard and I are very good friends. Jason Carn and I are very good friends and that came through collaborations and we just like, like get along and have a great time hanging out. Uh, but the other huge part of it is that one of the biggest questions I get from people are like, I'm trying to build, you know, a passive income business or I'm trying to do promote my t-shirt shop or something like that is how do I get an audience? How do I get people to come look at what I'm doing? And when you collaborate with people, you're doing something that I call using other people's audiences. Mm -hmm. So by collaborating, other people have built these big followings. Perfect example is Von Glitchka. By the way, he's become a very good friend. He's He's the man. He is. He's such a nice guy. Um, 
we had lunch at P.F. Chang's like two weeks ago, and uh, he's he's just an amazing, super, super nice dude. And he's got a massive following, right? He has like the most awesome social media accounts, in my opinion, because he just tells it how it is. He's hilarious on Twitter, man. He's always like, he's he's attacking Adobe all the time. Like, fix this shit, man. What's going on? What's this error? Why does anybody want this? It's hilarious. Follow uh, Von Glitchka if you need a good laugh, guys. Do, yeah. And the funny part is, is he's on their focus panels. So they actually have him giving his advice, but he still will call them out and be like, this is ridiculous. Why would you do this? Or Scott, I saw the funniest thing the other day. He's on LinkedIn and someone posts on LinkedIn. It was a, one of those like big kind of logo farm companies. Mm-hmm. And they were like, which logo do you love the most? Oh, a, B, good. C, or D, right? And his comment is the top comment with like 25 upvotes. And it's like, I choose E, the one you haven't made yet. <laughs> and then he went into it. And I asked him, why do you write that kind of stuff? Like, aren't you worried about people just like getting angry? And he's like, I just see this as an opportunity to teach people and like to like educate them. And I kind of try to make it funny and, you know, they put it out there. I'm not trying to be me or pick on them, but it's true. Um, anyways, back to the point. So the point was that he has like a huge <laughs> following, right? Yeah. So when I saw a product of his, I get to interact with one of my heroes from the early days. Like ever since I started design, I've loved Von Glitchka. I get to, I get to work with him. Plus, he has a massive following. So I have a following I've built, but he has a following. So we kind of create double the following. You know what I mean? Like That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're doing right now, right? Yeah. Like, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk up this podcast, you'll talk up this podcast, and you'll get traffic, and uh, hope, hopefully I'll get some visitors. Actually, not even hopefully. I know I'll get visitors because every time I do podcasts like this, you get visitors. Well, you're it. dropping mad value too. Like This is exactly what a lot of my audience needs to hear is how to build passive income, how to take that little idea or the side project to the next level. That's why you're the perfect fit. Oh, yeah, and, and a lot of it is that, that collaboration. Um, so here, here's a question someone might want to know. Mm-hmm. How do you reach out to someone? How do you even spark the idea of a collaboration? How does it work for you? I know for me, uh, it's usually me just randomly hitting some a slide into someone's DMs. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I ask them, I, I shoot them an idea, and sometimes they don't respond. Sometimes they do. And I've met some of my best friends through Instagram on you know in, in London or you know over in Arizona, just randomly, me in Iowa through just – taking initiative and reaching out to someone through direct message. So I'm not sure how it works for you guys. Email, LinkedIn, mm-hmm. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, not LinkedIn really yet. Uh, but no, you're totally right. Well, so graphic design and just design in general is, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen this too. It's such a fertile area for so many opportunities that are untapped. So it's one of those areas where you can go and you can DM somebody and say, Hey, you want to collaborate? And literally like your design hero can just say yes. Mm-hmm. Like they're not, they're that accessible. Right. So I think that's the exciting thing about it. So a lot of times it's just reaching out, but I will say it's easier to get yeses when you can provide a very real value to the other person. So for instance, I reach out to people a lot and more and more now that retro supply is growing bigger, people reach out to me. But when I reach out, I generally tell them, Hey, I'd love for you to do this. It would be so neat for me. Typically it tends to be customers that are high profile customers. I'll say, Hey, can you know, would, would you want to be featured? And then I start talking about what's in it for them. I think the big thing is you can't talk about what's in it for you. I mean, they know that you're doing it because there's stuff in it for you. But say, I'll say things like, hey, like, you know, we have this big of a following and I think that it's going to get you some traffic. I think it's going to get you some traction on this. Uh, I I think that you're going to make some money from this. Just think about all the, like, I think about all the things that, like, I'd want, like, right? Like, we want, we all want, like, admiration. We all want more followers or more people to like us or see our work. We all want money. We all want all those things we all want more friends or more opportunities maybe to speak in front of people or to be on podcasts like this Mm -hmm. so i think the more you can talk to someone and talk their language in terms of things that are exciting to them the easier it is i I think at the same time if you're selling a project or a product you know speak to the benefit anyway yeah yep totally agree Speaking of sharing and being open and transparent, a lot of designers and creatives see, you know, everyone as a competition and 
I'm you and I definitely aren't like that. I feel the podcast allows me to be my most transparent and authentic self. But you are a huge believer in community, sharing what you know. Uh, you have a podcast, a newsletter. You give free values. You teach people how to do stuff, and to the point where this is how I do it. But if you don't want to learn it and you just want to buy the product, you know you can do that as well. Um, what's the value in sharing compared to seeing the world as your competition? I'll tell you a story that made a big difference for me because I always thought of it as the world's my competition. The world's my competition. I can't share with anyone. I can't partner with people. Everyone's going to take from me. So I remember when I was on Creative Market and my shop started to take off. I mean, at one point it was like the front page had like seven of my products on it. I, I was I was killing it. Like it was like my moment, right? I was so excited. And then Creative Market reached out to me and said, can you write some blog posts about what you're doing that's creating sales so other people can do the same thing? And honestly, Scott, like my initial deep reaction was, why on earth would I want to share how I'm doing that? I want all the monies for myself. I don't, I don't want to share. I don't want to share these tips with other people. And and then I'm, I'm just being honest, man. That's like how I thought about it. And then I really started to just think a little deeper about it. And I realized if I don't share it, they're just going to find someone else to share it. And so pure selfishness. I thought to myself, I might as well be, well be the one that shares it because people are going to figure it out anyway. So you have an opportunity here to teach people, be that person. So that's the initial selfish reason I did it. But then as I did it, you'd start to see people succeeding through like when I made the passive income for designer site, or if you still go to creative market and look at the blog posts, those blog posts are recommended constantly on their forums. So you see people grow and you see people's lives change. And as they rise, um, the saying is really true. You know, um, all, all boats rise with the tide. How's that saying go? I don't know. That sounded smart though. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying it totally wrong, but it's like, you know, all, all boats rise with the tide. So as other people succeed, you lift up with them. And I found it to be true in every case, every case where I've gotten. Uh, where here, I've, I had to research that one. A rising tide lifts all boats. Thank you. <laughs> yes. yes. Isn't that so much more eloquent? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it really does like, and so and when you teach people too, I've noticed we have a, a product, for instance, called hot foil. It's like this instant way to create like a, a gold foil effect, right? I made a tutorial and I just showed people exactly how I made the product. Exactly. Like they didn't need to buy the product. You can just go to the tutorial, look it up and learn how to do it. But what, but what happened, it was really counterintuitive. People would watch the tutorial. It wasn't even that hard, but people would just be like, screw it. I don't want to like follow a tutorial. I'd rather just give you $15 and get instant results. So there's always going to be people that want the easy button. I do. Me too. Sometimes my wife's like, well, we could do that ourselves. I'm like, yeah, but we could also just like pay $20 and then the pizza's here. Dude, I was going to say that's a prime example. That's why I eat so much pizza. I'm so damn lazy. <laughs> I have like a podcast edit, a drawing to do, like just deliver me some pizza. I don't want to cook. I do meal prep once a week. That's it. Right. Yeah. Right, man. Like you could make a pizza yourself. I mean, you know how it's, Dude, you, know, I can't, you can look it up. I can't tell you the last time I made a pizza. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like yeah. all the information's there. Yeah, exactly. You still pay. I, I want so the easy button. Exactly. It's convenience. Right. And then if you teach people, it proves to them that you're an expert, which makes it so when they do decide to buy it because they don't want to deal with it, they're like, well, who do you buy from? The person that won't show you anything who you can't know for sure actually can teach you anything or do it right? Or the person that's already proven, here's how to do it. And it, it, it attracts a loyal consumer as well with the word of mouth. And you know that's how you build a true, loyal, engaged following and consumer-based. Right. Yeah, exactly. The one thing I have noticed is you can never – you can never teach so much where someone says, oh, that's enough. I'll never buy anything from you because you've taught too much. That never will happen. Uh, your review page speaks for itself, by the way. What do you got? A, 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 over a thousand reviews on your products now? Yeah, we do. I can't, I can't believe that. Honestly, it's like, it's pretty amazing. Social uh, proof, man. Social proof. That's another huge thing. So when, when you're selling anything, whether it's design or whatever, um, there's certain triggers that people have. So I can tell people how great a product is in the newsletter. But if I, but people know I have a dog in the fight. I'm trying to sell a product. So I am making the best product I can for people, but social proof is super valuable because these people don't have a dog in the fight. They bought it, they parted with money, and they came, came back and said, this really helped me out. And I think when you see that, that's why, like, what? Like, if you're like me, when you go to Amazon, what do you do? Like, you read the synopsis of a book, then you immediately scroll down to the reviews, 
you look at the top reviews and then you look at the reviews that are like fours or threes to see what like the downsides are and you make a decision, right? That's why even with reviews, sometimes I wish we would get more, I mean, I don't want a ton of them, but sometimes I wish we would get more three-star reviews or even four-star reviews because we get so many five-star reviews. And I'm like, man, I know people are looking for these four-star reviews or three-star reviews. Like, so when one comes in, I don't feel like sad. I don't prune reviews. I keep everything up because I want people to see here's the downside. Here's the thing maybe you won't like about it. Um, but that's just like one, there's a, a variety of different triggers that help people to make buying decisions and social proof, like you said, is a huge one. Definitely. Um, so I want to know a little bit more or tell people a little bit more about your passive income for designers, face group, Facebook group, because again, community is huge with in our, our circles and you have your own little community that you've been grooming. I'm actually in it. Uh, there's times I'm involved and then there's times I'm just busy as hell, but I, I kind of prey on to see what people are talking about, kind of stalk <laughs> on the comments and stuff. It's like, I just, the same way. okay, okay, good. But I, some people lurking, lurking. Lurk, lurking. That's what I'm looking, <laughs> stalking and praying. That sounds like I'm a damn serial killer <laughs> choosing my victims one comment at a time. But, uh, tell people a little bit more about your passive income for designers, Facebook group. And, you know, maybe if it's a right fit for them and what you don't want in there. Right. Okay. So the passive income for designers Facebook group is a closed group. Um, basically the only requirement to get in is that you are trying to create a passive income using your creative skills and that you're not going there to spam people mm -hmm. with, I don't know, Viagra pills and exercise plans and things like that. Like if you're going there like legitimately to try to learn how to build a passive income or you already started one, but you want more help, you can go ask for an invite. I'll accept you in. And what's so cool is when I first started it, it was like hard to get conversations going, you know, and now it's it, like it hit like a certain number. And now people just start helping each other. I'll see like everything gets comments, everything gets some feedback. Oh, you should change this, try this out. There's a good mix of, of newbies that are just starting out along with people that are just killing it along with people that are just starting to get that initial traction. So you're just around people that are helping you to understand here's what works. Here's the things I tried that didn't work so you can avoid that and not have to deal with it. Um, and just to tack onto that, if you go to passiveincomefordesigners.com, if you're really into this kind of stuff, there's an email thing where you can sign up. And I have like five days where I teach five lessons with really simple half hour max assignments you can do each day to get yourself started on building a passive income, you know, from finding your first idea to how to like start building an audience. Um, so that can be useful too for people. Um, but yeah, try it out. It's, I, it changed my life. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but we're, we're good, man. I, I gotta tell you a story cause this is why passive income for me has been so cool. It, it has its stress like anything and it has its challenges like anything. But I remember when Ella, my first daughter was born, I remember going to target to buy her stuff. I was going to buy like, you have kids, Scott? I can't remember. I'm sorry. I got, I got two little baby kitties. No. Okay. No, okay. Okay. no humans. Okay. So you might relate to this in some ways. So I went to target. I was going to get like some of the basics, right? So for me, it was like some formula maybe, or little things like that for you it might be like some cat or whatever. Right? <laughs> but like, I like always buy little things from, so I was buying for my little girl. Like I bought her a little bear, bought her a cute little shirt and I could feel my phone vibrating in my pocket from sales. And when I went to check out at that target, I had made more money than the price of my bill at target. I, it felt like I was getting paid money to go shop at Target. So, and it, and I'm not a genius. I'm mm -hmm. not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I mean, I'm not dumb, but like, I'm no smarter than anybody else. If I can do this, anybody can do this. And that's an amazing feeling to have. So whether it's you need a little extra money and you'd love to be able to go get Thai food on Friday and not worry about paying your bills, if it's that... Sometimes you get projects that come in that you just don't want to do for a client, but you take it because you need the money. Mm -hmm. If you have that client that's like treating you like crap, but you have to say yes because you need the money, you go sign up for the group and try it. I, I always thought the idea seemed crazy until I tried it and it's just changed my life. It's literally changed my life. The folder for like the first three years I was in business was called God's Blessings because it was one of the most amazing life changing things that ever happened to me. That's awesome, man. 
No, I, I actually uh, signed up for that newsletter as well. And the Retro Supply newsletter as well. I'm on that one too. You can participate through the video. Thanks, man. <laughs> Well, let's just boil things down real quick for someone who, you know, wants to create their own products and sell them. What's just a couple basic steps and they can get more by following you or you're reaching out online or joining the Facebook group or the newsletter. But what are some practical, practical tips for someone wanting to create their own products and sell them just to get started? Sure. Yeah. So first thing is put something out now, make something super small. Don't worry about it succeeding or making you a ton of money. MVP? Put- MVP? Minimum, yeah, exactly. Minimum viable product. Just put something out that you're interested in and see what happens. That way you'll get yourself in the mindset of believing I'm a creator. I'm a person that ships things, gets things out the door. The other thing I would say is don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go look. There's so many things that you, when I say you, I mean people listening, Mm -hmm. buy as as a designer from other designers. So go look at the things that you're attracted to as a designer and ask yourself, What do I love about this? What part of this would I enjoy making? What part could I make better or could I change or could I add my own unique flavor to that would make it me, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't try to guess at what sells. Look at what's selling and how can you add your own self to it and make it different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think those two things can go a really long way. But um, as you know, because you're so consistent about stuff and I totally respect that about you, admire that. Consistently putting stuff out is probably the most powerful thing you can do. Agree. Like I believe in order to discover your best work, you need to put out a lot of shitty work. In order <laughs> in order to hit the home runs, you gotta keep getting back up to the plate and you know, taking swings and striking out or hitting a couple singles or you know, like hitting in some double plays, you're gonna fail. It takes a lot of crappiness, a, a lot of garbage, a lot of quantity to get to your quality. It's so true. Scotty, I've so I, I've done passive income for designer. I've done paid courses on this, workshops, talks on it. Before that, I worked for a business where we help solopreneurs. So I've seen literally over a thousand of them work on building businesses without question. The people that succeed are never the most talented. It's always the people that consistently move forward, put things out, adjust, try different tactics. Those are the people that succeed always, always, always. It's never the quiet lone genius that you, succeeds. You That's my experience. You can't tell me that every one of your products has been a banger, right? And been a hit. No. Right? You've no. Had, you've had a couple duds. Not more than the more than a couple. It's a you know, it's an it's an eighty twenty thing. And it's not necessarily because they're bad, but it's because certain products hit exactly on what people are just drawn to or, or need. It's not that the quality isn't there. It's just that, you know, a lot more people might need cool brushes for drawing than need something that makes seamless plaid patterns, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're rocking plaid, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you got to put a lot of stuff out and for sure. Okay. Before we get into the rapid fire, I think it's uh, necessary to plug your podcast, the Honest Designers podcast that you co-co-co-host. And I'm also <laughs> a big fan of Ian Barnard, so I want to plug him as well. He needs to be on the show one day. He's been a, a long time Instagram buddy of mine, but tell us a little bit more about the uh, Honest Designers podcast and who it's for. Sure. So Honest Designers started as a mastermind group. It was just a private group we were doing together. It wasn't going to be recorded, and we were just sharing our struggles with each other and helping each other out because we were all kind of shared some of the same struggles. And we did it for like five or six sessions, and we were like, we should record this. This stuff is all really you know useful stuff that like we could refer back to. And that evolved into making it a podcast. So essentially it's a podcast about everything that you would, that would be awesome and a struggle about design. And you get four unique perspectives. You get me, I kind of have more of like a a business passion about it. You have Ian, who's this amazing letter, who's experimenting with that kind of stuff, very much like Scott. You have Tom Ross, who's built a business, but also done web design. And you have Lisa Glanz, who's an illustrator who makes the most amazing, like woodland creature illustrations. So you get a very broad spectrum of opinions on how to make your life easier and more enjoyable as a designer. Awesome. And that's a weekly show, right? It's on every week, uh, released on Thursdays and, uh, yep. Very We're very consistent about releasing it every Thursday. Yeah, exactly. And it goes back to what you said just a little bit ago. Consistency. Consistency. Well, let's jump into rapid fire question mode. 
and you can't use pizza rolls on this one. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? I just went to Chicago and tried my first legit deep dish. So I'd have to say a deep dish with a complete like hubcap layer of sausage on top. It's delicious, dude. And it has like a butter crust. Oh, um, man, you got to try it at some point. You'll, I'll, I'll let you take me on a date there sometime if we're in <laughs> Chicago at the same time. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> uh, what program would you live in each day if you had a choice? Illustrator. No my question. man. My man. <laughs> you too. I, I, don't, I don't show much of my vector stuff. I just, I just got an iPad today, the iPad pro. I mean, not necessarily vector, but, uh, digital work. So I don't show much of it and I'm a vector junkie on the side, which, Mm -hmm. you know, I need to show more of that, but all right, I'm feeling that, uh, script serif or sans serif. I have to say sans serif. God, everybody says sans serif. I don't even need to (laughs) everybody. Like this is probably five in a row now. Yeah. Well, why it's purely emotional <laughs> i see i see futura and i use gotham on my side i just i just see the, those and they just hit me so hard every time i see them i never get tired of seeing them do you like the clean and modernness and finding ways to bring that vintage vibe to it yeah yeah i guess that's it i just feel like it's so it has so much historical power to it but it also just stands on its own today just as well all right I, mean, I feel bad now. I, I guess I could say Baskerville. No, a Baskerville. No, so, what's your favorite typeface? To be completely honest, is it Futura? Um, Gotham. Gotham. I love Gotham. I love Futura. I'm I'm an Avenir guy, so I mean, we we have Frutiger roots in us. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you go. Cool, man. Well, <laughs> hey, where can people go to find you online? So you can go to retrosupply.co. That's where you can buy all sorts of good historical inspired goods. You can go to PassiveIncomeForDesigners.com if you're looking to start a little side hustle and make a little extra money on the side, or who knows, maybe a ton of money on the side. Um, Or you can go to DesignCuts.com, and there'll be a little navigation bar menu that says Honest Designer Show, and you can check out Honest Designers. We have a a pretty big library at this point. I don't know if it's quite as big as yours, Scott. I know you're hitting like 55 right now or something like that, but we have somewhere in the range of maybe 30, 40 episodes, I think, I think, but there's plenty to plenty to hear there. Nice. All right. Um, and last one, I believe you have a code for our listeners. Pizza roll 30. You go use that. It'll work one time for each customer. You can go get 30% off, uh, on anything from Metro Supply, you could buy the whole shop and get 30% off. You can buy one, you know, font for 10 bucks and get 30% off, whatever you want. Plus, if you sign up, you get like nine free things if you, like, you don't want to buy anything at all. It's like you win. It's it's a win, win, win. You can win however you choose to do it. And I swear by this dude's products as well. I have them myself that I use at home. I don't share a lot of it because it's more digital. I'm diving into that, but I'm a big believer in what Dustin does what Dustin does, what Dustin do, but (laughs) thank you so much for being on the show, dude. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. Scotty, thank you for so so much for having me on. I had heard of you so much, but when I saw you speak at weapons of mass creation, WMC fest, you were so amazing up there and you got me so excited because you were just so transparent about the things that you've struggled with. And I love, hearing stories about people that struggle because I struggle so much mm-hmm. when I hear it. It makes me think if, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, like that's why like, I talk about like the things I talk about. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on. I feel like in that way, in, in that way, and so many other ways we're kindred spirits. So we're brothers. Honor. We're brothers. It's an now. honor to be on, man. Hell yeah, we dude. Got- I appreciate you so much. Uh, we got to keep in touch and just thanks again, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Hey, oh, this show was a heater and you better believe I'm having Dustin back in 2018 so we can do a deeper dive into, you know, how you and I can take a more practical approach on monetizing our creative pursuits with, you know, products and building a better system that can benefit us as we put out work into the world that hopefully benefits others. A win-win. As promised, here's how you can win a free t-shirt. Real simple. The first three, three, just three of you, the first three listeners who share this episode on Twitter and tag Retro Supply Co. and of course myself, 
you will immediately win and Dustin will contact you and get your information to ship you your winnings. It's it's that easy. Simply share the show. First three people. Also, don't forget to use the discount of Pizza Roll 30. P I Z Z A R O L L 30 to get a whopping 30% off anything in his shop as there's some serious heavy hitters in there that will massively evolve your work. Uh, You can go check out the site and see for yourself. And if you're enjoying what you hear, there's two ways that you can support the show. First off, the supporters over at patreon.com slash perspective podcast are making a huge difference in allowing me to elevate this show to where I envision it being. With as little as $1, $3, or $5 per episode, you can help me keep up with audio hosting, web hosting, recording software, and equipment. Not only that, but I want there to be a benefit for you. So you can get things like critiques on your work, access to exclusive discounts on my shop, uh, bonus episodes, all types of things. So it's not just you helping me, but hopefully I'm giving some value back to you. Again, you can invest in the growth of this show by visiting patreon.com slash perspective podcast. Another way to support the show is by leaving a quick ratings and review over on iTunes. It not only helps the show get discovered, but it gives me an opportunity to give you a nice little thank you plug like this week's rating and review. And this one comes from the one and only, the homie, Eric Friedenson of F. Studio. Eric says, even after just listening to a few episodes, I'm already in love with this podcast. Scotty provides a balance between the butt-kicking motivation we all need and tactical strategies for staying on track in your creative career. Great for artists, designers, or anyone trying to gain the confidence necessary to put themselves out there. My man, FDOT, you should totally check out this guy's work. He He's one of a kind, and uh, I would consider him one of my best friends I've met in the last couple of years through you know, this creative game and attending conferences and Instagram. So check him out. And uh, stoked for next week's episode. I want to plug it right now. I got my homie Tony, Tony, Tony Diaz of Industry Print Shop in Austin, Texas coming on the show to share his story and drop some value. I think you're going to get a lot from it. Also, shout out to Nick Jenkins of Bluka for all the dope theme music you hear on this show. Go show him some love over on SoundCloud or on Instagram at Bluka. That's B-L-O-O-K-A-H. And finally, as you finish this week off strong, I want to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this.